All right, total internal reflection. I'm going to teach you about mirages, why you see a mirage in the desert, and also this is very important technologically because the physics you'll learn in, in this section uh, helps you understand why diamonds shine so beautifully, uh, and also optical fibers are used to carry uh, telephone signals and many other signals, including uh, you have optical fibers in some of your stereo systems that go, um, that carry the, the optical signal from one component to another. Uh, one application of optical fibers is these um, endoscopes. There are two optical fiber cables, one providing light to illuminate interior body parts and the other sending back images for viewing. And so you're able to, to uh, view, well, that's a disgusting image, I gotta say. Um, polyps and colonoscopy, et cetera, et cetera. So, but these fibers channel light and use the principle of total internal reflection in order to, um, to operate. So let me start off with a demo. Okay, now we have total internal reflection. No beam makes it through this air-water interface. And I want to come back the other way and, and, and look at the intensity of this reflected beam right here as I approach the critical angle from the other direction. Okay, as soon as a beam appears on this screen here, then I'll know that I've made it through and passed. Okay, now I've just passed the uh, critical angle for total internal reflection. There's still a reflected beam here and a refracted beam here. But the reflected beam is getting dimmer by the second. And as we move further and further away from the critical angle, that reflected beam becomes more and more difficult to see. Okay, as we've seen, at any interface, at a water-air interface, for example, you always get a reflected ray, but in some cases you do not get a refracted ray, one that goes from the one to the other. And in particular, the reason that we're starting in the laser beam in the water and then coming up toward air is that that's the case where you can see total internal reflection. So here's the idea, and this is what we just showed with the demonstration. If the incident ray has near normal incidence. So so this is what I would call normal incidence. If the incident ray is perpendicular to the surface, you'll definitely get a reflected ray and a refracted ray. Okay? This is also near normal incidence. You'll, you'll always get a reflected ray and a refracted ray. But there's an angle, if you um, keep on getting bigger and bigger and bigger, there's a critical angle for total internal reflection, theta sub c. If you're beyond that angle of incidence, bigger than that angle of incidence, then you don't get a refracted ray. And um, all of the light is internally reflected into the water. So, and the particular angle of incidence is easy to derive because as you start at normal incidence and get bigger and bigger angle of incidence, this refracted ray, that refracted ang angle of refraction becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And once it gets to the point where the angle of refraction is 90 degrees, then, then you have this uh, critical angle for total internal reflection. So we can easily derive it because we know that theta 2 is 90 degrees. If we start off with n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2, and we put in theta 2 of 90 degrees, sine of 90 is 1. And so we just get one here, and we can solve for theta one by dividing both sides of this equation by n one. 
So divide this side by N1, the N1s cancel out. On this side, we get N2 over N1. And that'll give you the critical angle. And remember, this is the angle of incidence for total internal reflection. That's the critical angle of incidence. for total internal reflection. Now note that we're starting in the optically dense, more, uh, dense material, N1, and ending, we're reflecting, we're starting here in water, for example. Uh, this won't work. You won't get uh, an angle of incidence if you start in the air and then try and reflect off of water. And the reason is that N1 is the bigger one, N2 is the smaller one, N2 would be air in this case, right? N2 equals, say, example, for example, 1, N1 for water is 1.33. Well, we end up with an N2 over an N1, that's 1 over 1.33, and that's point, about 0.75 that we talked about before. Well, you can find, uh, if the sine of theta is 0.75, um, no problem, you can find the angle theta c. But if you reverse these two, uh, you, you got a sine of an angle that's 1.33, and it's embarrassing to find the inverse sine because you never get a sine that's bigger than one. So that's the embarrassing situation. You have to be starting off in the optically um, dense medium in order to get total internal reflection. All right, uh, how does this work with diamonds? Diamond, as we talked about before, has a large index of refraction, which is about 2.42. <coughs> light ray strikes a diamond air interface at an angle of incidence of 28 degrees. Is there total internal reflection? Repeat for a diamond water interface. So here we've got a diamond material, uh, and this is in air. Around the diamond, we've got air. We've got an angle of incidence here. It comes in. Uh, it's actually outside that critical angle for, for diamond in air. Let's actually take a look and find out what that angle is. Theta, sine of theta C was N2 over N1. And we're inside the material, remember? So we're starting off N1 is for diamond, that's 2.42. And N2 is for air. So N2 is one, that's that number here. N1 is 2.42, and the inverse uh, sine of that ratio is 24.4 degrees. So in fact, if we start off with an angle of incidence of 28 degrees, this angle here, that's not close enough to normal incidence to get a refracted ray. And you get no refraction here. And what we mean by no refraction is that we have total internal reflection. Those two mean the same thing. If there's no refracted ray, then all the light is internally reflected. Well, so what if you put it in water, then? If you put it in water, then what changes? Well, instead of air, which had an index of refraction of 1, you've got water with an index of refraction of 1.33. Take that ratio. The ratio is actually uh, not as small as it was before. The angle is now 33 degrees. So uh, the angle of incidence here again, it's still the same 28 degrees. But now you have a critical angle for diamond and water, which is 33.3 degrees, instead of, for uh, the critical angle for diamond in air is 24.4. So now, this ray is inside that normal incidence window. And 
you do get both a reflected and a refracted ray. So the diamond is going to be less brilliant if you put it in water. You don't get as many internal reflections. That's what this slide's all about. The diamond is famous for its uh, sparkle because the light coming uh, is, is moved about. Why does a diamond exhibit such brilliance? Why does it lose much of its brilliance when placed underwater? The idea is that a lot of the light coming in the top surface, top facets of the diamond, get reflected and totally internally reflected by these two um, walls of the, of the diamond. And, and that causes the light to, to, to reflect internally and then come back out the top, giving it its dazzle. Uh, total internal reflection is used in binoculars to turn a ray of light through an angle of 90 degrees. Let's see if we can do that. If we've got glass and out here air, and we've got an incident ray that comes and we've got a, a, a prism that is cut at an angle of 45 degrees. And so if this ray comes straight through this, this interface, there is a reflected ray here, but we're not really worried about it. We're just worried about the transmitted ray. And it's near normal, nor, near normal incidence, and so we do get a refracted ray at this interface. Then we get to this interface, and that's the critical one. So now we're internal. We're in the optically dense, more, uh, op more optically dense material. And here's the surface between glass and air. Here's the normal to that surface. The angle of incidence is the angle between the incident ray and the normal. And that angle is 45 degrees. So now all we need to know is what's the critical angle of incidence uh, for reflection, for total internal reflection off of a glass air interface. Easy to work out. Sine of theta c is n2 over n1. We take the inverse sine of both sides. Um, n1 is for glass. n2 is for air. Remember, uh, okay, so n2 is for air, n1 is for glass, and we get 42 degrees. So that cone for near normal incidence is 42 degrees wide. So if we're inside this cone, then we will get a refracted ray. But we're outside. We're at a more of a glancing incidence. So we'll get total internal reflection at this angle of 45 degrees. We'll get total internal reflection at this uh, angle of maybe 80 or 90 degrees, we'll get total internal reflection at these very, very glancing angles. Anything outside that cone that's centered on the normal incident um, perpendicular ray will get uh, total internal reflection. So we do. We get total internal reflection here. We get all of the light coming in and hitting this interface gets reflected by it. And uh, it's a very efficient mechanism. If you put two of these together, you get what you see in, in binoculars. The, the light ray comes through a lens, uh, then it hits this little prism thing that bounces off at a 45, bounces off at a 45, and this is what is used to actually rectify the image in, in binoculars so it's not, not reversed. Um, optical fibers, like we talked about before, are um, one of the most important applications of total internal reflection. So here's a couple of um, demos. Total internal reflection is important in technology. A lot of communications are done, including telephone and other communications. You may have an optical cable in your home stereo or home theater system that uh, communicates audio information through uh, an optical cable. The principle is uh, total internal reflection. If we come in at a glancing angle, then all of the light that's incident 
on this surface and on this surface will be reflected back internally into the uh, material. So, so it works for glancing angles and the, the beam needs to be confined within a material that is more optically dense, has a higher index of refraction than the surrounding material. But any shape will do. You can use a rectangular shape here, you can use a circular shape, um, confining all that light inside of that fiber. And this is a more typical light uh, optical cable or, or light fiber. I'm just going to introduce the, the beam here. You'll see it come out on the far end. This is an example of, uh, we have a source of light in the base here, and each of these, all they are strands of uh, plastic, and they are channeling the light uh, through them, and they can be bent or whatever, and they'll still channel that light. There is a certain radius, if you, if you bend it, if you kink it really hard, then that uh, brings you away from the total internal reflection and, uh, and you lose the effect. But very effective, very important in, in today's technology, total internal reflection. Okay, this is uh, just a diagram of the sort of uh, devices that we saw. <clears throat> All you need is a piece of plastic or glass to have a light, uh, an optical fiber. Um, you've got the optically dense material here and optically less dense material outside. A lot of times they'll put some cladding or things to protect the, the, piece, the, the glass fiber or the plastic fiber. But ultimately, as long as you've got, um, <clears throat> if this ray, instead of being at a glancing angle to this interface, were at a more normal incidence, then we would be inside that cone that would allow a refracted ray. But we're not. We're at a glancing incidence. So as long as these angles, the angle between the normal and the ray is large, meaning also that the angle between the surface and the ray is small, a glancing angle, then you'll always uh, confine this ray to the interior of it, even if it's uh, turned. And, and you can actually bend an optical fiber to the point where it no longer will channel all the light. And that's, that's because you've, you've made that uh, angle of incidence large enough to be within that cone. Uh, arthroscopic surgery um, also uses optical fibers. The surgeon can insert the instrument, a cable into a joint, and uh, only a tiny incision, minimal damage. But optical fibers make this, make this happen. Uh, mirages. You've all seen them on the road on a hot day. A nice flat, long flat road uh, on a very hot day, best place to see a mirage. Uh, you see them in the desert when you're running out of water, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It, is it a, you say it's a mirage, but I say it's an actual real phenomenon. You do see blue. And, be, and, and the reason you see blue is that you see the sky reflected in the road surface because of total internal reflection. How does it work? Light from the sky at a shallow angle. So we're talking about a, sh a large angle of incidence here. Here's the normal. This is a layer of hot air. And this is cooler, uh, below the, that's below that dotted line. This uh, solid line is the road surface. Above this is cooler air. Cooler air is more dense than hot air is, more optically dense. And so we're inside the optically dense material in this cool air. So that light ray comes and hits this interface, and if it's at a glancing enough angle, the difference between these two indices of refraction is very, very small, because remember, the, the index of refraction of air is 1.001 or something like that, really, really close to one. 
But there's enough of a difference that if you're really at a glancing angle, which you are when you're looking straight ahead, far away uh, to, to a hot road, then you'll see the sky reflected in the road, and that's what a mirage is. You don't see the road at all. There's no refracted ray. So uh, you can't get any communication between the road and this, and this ray outside. So your eye sees only what's reflected from the sky above. Now, if there were trees or mountains or whatever, I've, I've seen where instead of you see, seeing a blue mirage, you can see the green trees or the hills or whatever. It will reflect whatever's up ahead. So that's mirages.